السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين ونصلي ونسلم على أفضل الخلق أجمعين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد As always we commence by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala All praise is indeed due to him we commence also by sending blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless him and his entire household and to grant them all acceptance and at the same time to bless every single one of us and to grant every single one of us acceptance. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep our offspring also on this deen and may he really use us to be from amongst those who can be of use not only to themselves but even to the deen in a way that we can convey it to others and in a way that it can be a means of our entry into paradise in a way that we can be closer to the Almighty tomorrow than we are today and in a way that we are closer to Him today than we were yesterday. Amen. It is an honor to be here at this University of Bradford in this beautiful hall Moments ago, I tried to tweet an image of what I saw in front of me, but sadly, the internet connection is not that grand. <laughs> so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us the gathering here. I am actually overwhelmed to see so many people here. And I think to myself, I ask Allah to accept it from all of us. Wallahi, we are non-judgmental people. We love everyone we come across for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My brother, my sister. You might have a weakness, I might have 10. And at the same time, what you need to know is, we will work to help one another. You are also loved by Allah. No matter what your weakness is, work on it. If you have an intention to earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you are striving in that direction, what gives me the right to point at you and say you're a bad person? Remember this, and this is why a loser is he who does not give hope to others. We're all human beings. And it does not mean that just because I appear to be a Muslim, that the others are not Muslimin or they are bad people. How many people we know have appearance that is absolutely brilliant, but their deeds are far further than those who sometimes might not be up to scratch outwardly. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. I am saying this, but I need to qualify the statement. And that is, in no ways are we promoting that people should not deal with the outer appearance. No, we should be dealing with both. And we should be dealing with whatever is easier for us or whatever by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we can within our means as soon as possible. So this evening we will be speaking about walking in the light of the Qur'an. If you open the Qur'an, it starts with Surah Al-Fatiha. I'm sure we would all know it off by heart. Surah Al-Fatiha. And we know its meaning by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether or not we concentrate on that meaning in salah is something else. Because a lot of the time shaitan comes to distract us in salah. When we say Allahu Akbar, the Surah Al-Fatiha has a name known as salah. Salah is one of the names of the surah. The hadith says, قَسَمْتُ الصَّلَاةَ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَ عَبْدِي نصفين. Surah Al-Fatiha has been divided between myself and my worshipper split into two. When my worshipper says, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, I say, my worshipper has praised me. When he says, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, I say, he has glorified me. When, I say, uh, when he says, Maliki Yawm al I say, he has declared my greatness. When he says, Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'een, I say, this is between me and my worshipper. And for my worshipper is whatever he asks for now. And then what do we ask? <laughs> Guide us to the straight path. That is the most powerful dua you could ever make. It is the one we repeat so many times. And this is why Surah Al-Fatiha is known as Salah. It is repeated in Salah. Amazing. The difficulty is, or should I say the challenge is, when we are walking in the light of the Qur'an, we would be needing it every moment of our lives. It will come to our rescue every moment of our lives, no matter what we are going through. But there is a condition. And that condition is you need to be a believer, and you need to try your best to do good deeds. That's the condition. And I will come to that in a few moments. But 
try your best to concentrate on the meanings of what you're uttering in salah, it will change your outlook to this prayer that you have five times a day. I firmly believe that the youth or the youngsters or even the adults who feel lazy to fulfill salah don't actually know what it's all about. They don't know that you're putting your head down on the ground, not for someone or something, but for the Creator who made you and for the one you are going to return to. And this is taught in the Qur'an. So what a beautiful book, if only we understood and we made an effort to understand. I have spoken within the, this university in the past, as well as several other universities in the UK, and we have said this and made mention of how important it is to try and understand the Qur'an. And I reiterate that this evening to say, my brothers, my sisters, make an effort, learn a few words a day. Learn one verse of the Qur'an a day. Understand it so that when it is read, you know that this is what it means. If you were to take, for example, discs of tafsir of a speaker of your choice who has explained perhaps words of the Qur'an, and you were to play that regularly, perhaps in your vehicle or your iPods or what have you, wallahi there will come a time when if you hear a verse of the Qur'an, you will smile. I know what it means, subhanallah. I know what this means. I see a lot of smiles here, which means you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> no, don't worry, don't worry. There are no parrots today. <laughs> By the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let's take a look at the next surah. When Allah chooses the order of the Qur'an, He has chosen it with a purpose. This is the order in what is known as the preserved tablet or Allah al mahfuz And we need to understand the second surah is known as Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah knows why it's there. It's about the cow. The cow, some people worship the cow up to today. The cow being made mention of in the surah was a cow that was meant to be a sacrificial cow at the time of the Prophet Moses, may peace be upon him, Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. So Allah says, Alif Lam I know and you know that the meaning of that is solely known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He kept it in his knowledge. Why and how only he knows. So we stop there. We call them hurufun muqatta'at or muqatta'ah. They are separated letters Allah knows the meaning of. ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ Indeed, these are the verses of the book which has no doubt. There is no doubt in the book. And no doubt in these verses, there is guidance for those. Guidance for whom? Those who are conscious of their maker. There comes a time in your lives and my life where we become more conscious of our maker because we start becoming old. Something happens, you suffer this way or that way, and you start thinking, what's the purpose of my existence? Believe me, there are non-Muslims who have turned to the goodness of Islam after having tasted every aspect of evil that there is out there, and they want to taste the pure life and they end up tasting it and promising never to go back to its dirt meaning to the dirt of the previous life. Whereas there are born Muslims who have it on the golden platter, who still want to go out and test and taste what the evil is all about. Allah safeguard us. This is why I have seen reverts to Islam far stronger than sometimes born Muslims. They have seen the darkness of the outer world. They have been in the four stage of the glamour and glitter of the globe. They have been in the clubs and the pubs. And they have been in the, in the various nightlife aspects that there is and yet they've come out of that praising Allah and saying, Ya Allah, we thank you for having saved us. And yet there are others on the other hand who are born Muslimin and Muslimat. They could not be bothered to even dress appropriately. They cannot wait to get out of the eye of their parents in order to abandon their Islamic dress and then get back when their parents are there to pick them up or when they're going home and don it again hypocritically. May Allah protect us from hypocrisy. This is why we say, grow genuinely, sincerely. My sister, we won't judge you. Your clothing might, but we won't. Allahu Akbar. May Allah protect us. We won't really, because we know that you may have a heart better than ours. This is a common statement. But I must say, don't use that statement to remain in your sin. Did you hear what Mufti Meng said? Well, he said that it's fine, I can do this. No, he didn't say that. No, he didn't say that. 
all we are saying is we all need to go closer to Allah. We will advise you have the right to advise me. Subhanallah. I need to take that advice. I need to make sure I understand. That is walking in the light of the Quran. The Quran is full of admonition and it is full of advice and encouragement and it is full of reminders of the mercy of Allah and at the same time warning of His punishment. It's a balanced book. It has tibaq, you know. One hand it is telling you that which is so good and a few moments later it is warning you of the bad. And it is telling you there is a flip side. Whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of Jannah and He says, He promises paradise beneath which are rivers that are flowing subhanallah forever and ever. Moments later you'll say, you'll see the verse, Jahannama khalidan fiha. Allah protect us. Allah speaks of hellfire wherein some people shall dwell either for a long, long time or for eternity. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala treat us with His mercy. So Allah has kept it a balanced book. When you walk in the light of the Qur'an, you will only be able to achieve goodness. It will help you in your sadness. This evening we have the family of the deceased. May Allah grant him paradise. Adil Hussein. And we all know whom I'm speaking about. He was at this uni traveling to one of the lectures that I was delivering. And wallahi, our hearts go out to this individual and to all the others who have passed on to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To be honest, when you are at a point of sadness, if you walk in the light of the Qur'an, you will find a lot of solace, comfort, a lot of goodness, a lot of words that will bring about a smile after a tear, and a tear after a smile. Amazing. This is why when we speak, sometimes we would like to smile because of the goodness, and sometimes we cry because we are trembling. لَوْ أَنزَلْنَا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ عَلَىٰ جَبَلٍ لَرَأَيْتَهُ خَاشِعًا لَرَأَيْتَهُ خَاشِعًا مُتَصَدِّعًا مِّنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ Allahu Akbar Allah says, had we revealed this book onto a mount, we would have found it humble humility. In such humbleness, perhaps it may even crumble in the humility, humbleness, the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But man, he has a book, the word of Allah, the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the most powerful word. Today, if you think this man is eloquent, that woman is eloquent, this person knows how to speak, believe me, you have not yet tasted the speech of Rabbul Alameen, the creator of entire creation. You haven't yet tasted it. Nothing compares, nothing competes. If that word has not moved you, nothing will move you. This is why you hear the beautiful recitations of our Qurra who are seated with us. When you hear the Qur'an, if your hairs do not stand or you do not feel some form of movement, something somewhere is wrong. You do not have the tool that is required to feel the light of this book because it is light. يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ قَدْ جَاءَتْكُمْ مَوْعِظَةٌ مِّنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَشِفَاءٌ لِمَا فِي الصُّدُورِ وَهُدًا وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ O oh people, يَا أَيُّهَا nas, not even O oh you who believe, but O oh people, something has come to you, a reminder has come to you, a mawidah has come to you, a warning has come to you. That is revelation. That is the book we are speaking about. From your Rabb, from your Maker, from the one in absolute control of your happiness and your sadness. He has revealed something to you. And in it, there is cure for that which lies in the heart. What lies in the heart? Two aspects. Don't think it's only referring to spirituality. It even refers to the physical condition of the heart. When you, this, this afternoon I spoke at a masjid and I made mention of how the Prophet ﷺ says, أَلَا وَإِنَّ فِي الْجَسَدِ لَمُضْغَةِ إِذَا صَلَحَتْ صَلَحَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّهُ وَإِذَا فَسَدَتْ فَسَدَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّهُ أَلَا وَهُ أَلَا وَهِيَ الْقَلْبُ He says, behold, there is a piece of flesh in the body. If it is good and pure, the whole body will be good and pure. And if it is bad and evil, the whole body will be bad and evil. Behold, it is the heart. This hadith is not only referring to spirituality, but your heart. 
If the blood that pumps in your heart is pure and good, your body is also pure and good physically as well. So it's over and above spirituality. This is why when you are sick, what does the doctor do? He sends you for a blood test. And then he figures out from the blood test what's wrong. That's the blood that's pumping in your heart. So if the blood pumping in your heart was pure, the doctor would be able to say, you know what, there's nothing wrong with you. From Based on what? The heart. So your heart needs to be upon a certain condition. Physically is one thing, more importantly spiritually. If your heart is not on a specific minimum at least, how do you want to benefit from the Qur'an? Let me give you two examples. Walking in the light of the Qur'an, take Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. He heard a few verses, the opening verses of Surah Taha. I'm sure we would all know that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in those verses, explaining that this Qur'an has not been revealed to you in order for it to be a means of your distress. Some people, Muslims, they think, you know what, Allah just comes up with all these rules and regulations and you know what, it's just too much. Islam has too many rules and regulations, so not only will I not accept it, a'udhu billah, or I may turn away. Astaghfirullah. Believe me, your maker knows what rules and regulations you need to succeed. It's not easy. When you have an experiment, for example, in the science lab, you need to make an effort to gather together whatever chemicals you need, whatever apparatus you need, the tripods you need, the Bunsen burners you need, and what have you, and everything put together thereafter, you need to go in, you might try it once or twice, you will find whatever findings you have, and you may have to do it again and again, until you then, as a person who may be a scientist or what have you, would then achieve whatever you would like, with a great effort. It doesn't mean, no, they require so much from us, I've got to go out, get a Bunsen burner, come back, get the gas, organize the tripod, come and get this chemical, get the other one, bring the beaker, bring the cylinder, bring this conical, whatever else it is. Believe me, if you are not prepared to make that effort, you cannot be that scientist and you will not be able to achieve that result. So if you are not prepared to follow the rules and regulations of the Almighty, how do you want to taste the beauty of the Qur'an? How do you want to taste the beauty of the deen? My brothers, my sisters, one promise you need to make is to become conscious of the fact that your maker is watchful. And you are answerable to your maker. If you are conscious of the fact that you are answerable to your maker, believe me, it will help you benefit from the Qur'an. Why do we say this? Let's go back to the first verses I read. Allah says, فِيهِ هُدَى لِلْمُتَّقِينَ الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ وَيُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ In it there is guidance for those who are conscious. You know what taqwa means? Taqwa has a very very broad meaning. But let's just say the consciousness of Allah. Some people say the fear of Allah. I believe today... If we were to say the consciousness of Allah, it includes hope as well as fear. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala benefit us and may He make us from those who understand. The verses continue to say, Who are those who are truly conscious? Those who establish their prayer. This five salah you have a day. Do not take it lightly, my sisters, my brothers. Don't take it lightly. It has in it the content that will make you benefit from the Quran and see the light in it. So if you become regular with your salah, initially, you might have to force yourself. Initially, you, you might be lazy. It might not go down so well with your nafs, with your soul, because you're not used to it. Become used to getting up for salatul fajr and see how your spirituality is moved. See how you become closer to Allah. See how when you see a brother or a sister trying to get close to Allah, it brings a smile to your face, rather than saying, that woman in this niqab, I better walk away before people associate me with terrorism. That's what happens. You don't, there are non-Muslims who are so forthcoming to our sisters in niqab or hijab, and there are Muslim sisters who don't want to have anything to do with them. All this has got to do with the condition of your heart, my brothers, my sisters. And how to improve that? Develop your consciousness of the maker within you, subhanAllah, and you will find great achievement. By the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have so much to gain. Allah says, those who are truly conscious are those who establish their salah. You force yourself to establish it initially. And after a little while, you'll find you won't be able to do without it. And then you have another beautiful point made mention of immediately after that. Those who believe in the unseen. In fact, that's the first point being mentioned. Those who believe in the unseen. You need to believe in the unseen. People sometimes don't believe in the unseen. So they start telling you, Astaghfirullah, if you watch, just watch the world. I found 
I've learned so much, so much, so much of how people think just through Twitter and Facebook. I've learned a lot of how people think and I appreciate it. A few days ago, if you might have noticed, I actually said, let people air their views. Without them airing their views, you won't know how to tackle them. You won't know what is needed in society because you're living in your own bubble. And this is why moments ago I was saying, I'm no big sheikh. Believe me, I'm just one of you guys. And all I'm trying to do is to make you conscious of what I feel you need to be conscious of from the little bit that I might have in terms of knowledge. And I'm not saying I'm a saint. You know, people ask me, why do you have this? Why do you have your image on Facebook? Brother, that's my weakness. Make dua for me. I'm one of you. <laughs> and this is a reality. I don't, need to, I don't need to prove to people that I'm a Pope before I can get across. And the same applies to you. My sisters, my brothers, I know of people who have engaged in so much da'wah or propagation of goodness and really they've had a huge impact yet they themselves are still walking on the path trying to live their life in the light of the Quran. So don't underestimate your value. I always say, we may not be able to enter paradise because of the deeds we've done but by the will of Allah we may be able to enter paradise by the deeds that were done by those whom we encourage to do good deeds. Have you thought of that? May Allah make us strong. Your deeds, my deeds may not be good enough. But if you've said a good word that has been used for others to do good deeds, maybe that might just be something that Allah might look at and say, you know what? Never mind you, but look at what those have done because of what you've said. I am in no way saying that you should live a life contrary to what you preach. I would like to try my best to practice what I preach. If I say something, by the will of Allah, I try my best to live upon it. But sometimes human weakness, the others might have followed it to the T. And maybe because of that, Allah might grant you goodness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that goodness. So this is why we say, those who believe in the unseen to start with, and secondly, those who fulfill their salah, and those who spend. Why spend? It's very, very interesting. I think... So, mashallah, we, we have such a gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is telling us, you want to benefit from the Qur'an, develop your consciousness of the maker. Believe in the unseen. Like I said, we learn so much, there is a lot that we have. And there is so much that we need to learn about others and about ourselves as well. Sometimes, belief in the unseen, when we engage in sin, sometimes we forget for a moment that we are answerable to Allah and whatever is around us is actually watching us. The walls, the floor, whatever else, you know, your phone, say what you want, it might be brought in order to bear witness for you or against you. I was telling someone today, if you see me on my phone, I am doing something very, very important. Subhanallah. Don't just think I'm, you know, messing about and so on. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. And you know what? Even the statements of romance to your spouse and so on is something extremely important. Today I was telling friends as we were driving to this venue that you know what? If you haven't spoken or if you haven't said, this is obviously my little gauge. My gauge might be different from yours. If you haven't said a hundred times to your spouse how much you love them and how much they mean to you per day, something's wrong. I said... Count it. How many times did you say it today? Most of you guys will get to three or four. <laughs> we are saying a hundred. There's a reason why I say a hundred. Because if you're aiming at the skies, perhaps you get to the cloud. And there's one cloud known as cloud nine. Subhanallah. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. Really. So if I get to that cloud, I'm very happy by the will of Allah. But I was aiming at the skies. Do you see? But if I don't aim at the skies, where am I going to get? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that goodness. So to benefit from this Qur'an, you need to firstly believe, believe in the unseen. Establish your salah, give out from that which Allah has given you. Why? Because materialism has a lot of magnetism that comes with it, that makes you cling to it, thinking that I've got it and I am it at a certain time. Initially, it is the wealth and the materialism. And after a while, I have got it. Notice. And after a while, I am it. You see how it changes? One makes you go to the other. And when you think I am it, Allah slowly comes out of your equation. So this is why, don't do that. 
Materialism is materialism. You will get to your grave. It's not going to help you unless you've spent it in a good path. And to spend it even on your family members and on your duty and obligation, wallahi, is a good deed. So this is why we say, don't cling yourself to the latest. I stopped wearing a watch from January. Stop. Why? I've got a phone. It tells me the time. The brother told me, how long will you speak for? I said, 45 minutes to one hour. Do you need a reminder? No, my phone will remind me. It's a fact. I can look at it. 25 minutes, 48 seconds. MashaAllah. <laughs> the truth is, the reason why I don't want to wear this watch is for, for me, I've got some of the latest watches, the thinnest watch that existed. I don't know how many milligrams at that time there. And it becomes such, you get hooked onto it. There is a time, you won't even find a pen in my pocket anymore. You won't find me wearing a thobe that requires cufflinks anymore. Why? Because that means nothing. So what? Big deal. You've got big cufflinks, a nice Rolex and so on. You need to Rolex into your salah. Believe me. <laughs> you need to have something that you can have between you and Allah. You know, yeah, Allah, I'm trying. I don't want materialism to overtake me. You might be saying, in fact, one scholar commented. He says, oh, that guy, I know him. He's very flamboyant and he's very glamorous. And I said, you know what? Is that just because I put on a little abaya as I come on the stage? It's only because people need to listen to someone and they won't listen to someone who's tatty and shabby a lot of the times. And that's the only reason. But if you meet me elsewhere, perhaps you might find me in my overalls doing my own work. And that's a fact. I know people are saying, I can't wait to see him in overalls. <laughs> but anyway, that's one of the things. We need to understand, Allah says, We have sent to you, O man, a reminder. It has come to you already. You have it. It's in your hands. A reminder. قَدْ جَاءَتْكُمْ مَوْعِذَةٌ From who? Not from this man or that one. You think he's an eloquent speaker. You think this guy can actually motivate you. No. رَبُّ الْعِزَّةِ وَالْجَلَالِ Allah is telling you, we have already sent you the biggest motivation ever. You have it in your hands. It's with you. It's in your phones. I was checking a verse or two moments ago and I was thanking Allah to say, Ya Allah, you've given me so much that I can just open my phone and I can check what I want to check at a moment. I want to check it and it's my phone, Samsung Korea. The owner of it perhaps never ever knew what was going on. And I am benefiting Samsung. Neither did Sam sing, nor did anything happen. I am busy looking at the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Have you thought of how powerful this tool is? So how do we benefit from it? The most powerful motivational speech and words that you ever, ever have are in your pocket today, my brothers and sisters. You need to make use of it. This is the Qur'an. How will you benefit from it? And how will you be able to walk in the light of the Qur'an if you just treat it as a little plaque or a little booklet or a little voice box or something that's just supposed to be seen in your pocket and you say, yeah, I've got it, that app, I've got that app, and the other app, and I've got the other app. An app on its own does nothing. You can add an LE at the end and it will give you food. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> it might give you a phone, a different type of a phone. <laughs> but if you, are, if you are in possession of an app, that is an Islamic app with the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will be asked about it, my brothers and sisters. You had the app on your phone, you had this thing, you needed guidance. When you were sad, Happiness was a step away, but you refused to look in the Qur'an. When you were happy, gratitude was in the Qur'an, you refused to look in it. When you had a day when you were low, to elevate you, you had to read a few verses, but you didn't. You sought happiness with drugs, with clubs, with the opposite sex, with beat, with everything else. It's like a seesaw. The more you have of one, the less you're going to have of the other. Your seesaw, decide where you would like to sit. Allahu Akbar. May Allah make us from those who understand. This is why we say, my brother, my sister, you want to walk in the light of the Qur'an, understand it has rules and regulations, and it has so much comfort for you, reminder for you. It has what you need and I. You will open the Qur'an and you read verses of mercy. And you will smile, close the Qur'an, think of those verses for a day, two days, a week, two weeks, whatever you'd like. You open the Qur'an, you read admonition. You read about hellfire. You read about how dangerous. You need that dose as well. Some people say, no, I don't want anyone to talk about hellfire. Why? Because Allah is very merciful. That's right. Allah is the most merciful. When He created creation, He declared that my mercy overtakes my anger. Allahu Akbar. He declared it. It's a declaration of Allah. 
His mercy is over and above his anger. Definitely. But that does not mean that we can ride on that. We can ride on that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us protection. We should never ever think that we can just ride on the mercy of Allah. Allah is merciful. People sin. In Allah ghafurur rahim. A while later you find them, you know, eating that which is haram. You say, but why? Say, in Allah ghafurur rahim. And a while later you find them perhaps in a nightclub and so on, drinking, you know, worse than a fish. And what happens? They say, in Allah ghafurur rahim. One day you need to come across the verse, Wallahu shadidul iqab as well. That Allah is definitely severe when it comes to penalizing. You need to come across that verse as well. You need to know it's there. We cannot be people who are not balanced, who only want to hear about mercy. Yes, we want to hear more about mercy because we are living in an environment that really is very testing and challenging. So thank Allah. Allah has given you the goodness. It's in your hands. Open it, you will find goodness. You have an examination coming up. Pick up the Qur'an, read verses of the Qur'an. It will give you comfort within to say, I've tried my best, I've made my dua, there is something known as tawakkul, I've laid my trust in Allah, now I'll write the exam. When your results come, you thank Allah, and you become closer to Allah because you passed, or you become closer to Allah because you failed. It happens. Allah knows why He made you pass or fail after you've tried. But when you open the Qur'an, it will tell you as well that you cannot expect assistance without you making an effort. وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِيْنَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُولَنَا Whom does Allah guide to His path? Whom does Allah guide? Those who struggle, strive and make an effort to be guided. You want to be guided, make an effort. You need to come to a talk. You need a talk on its own is not enough. It will only motivate you. After that, what will you do? You need to start learning in order. You need to pick up the Quran, read it in order. How many of us have completed the book? I have been championing this course for a long, long time to say, I challenge you, my brother, my sister, read the Quran cover to cover and complete it 20 times. See what happens. Every time you read a verse and you understand it, a different meaning will dawn to you. When I say a different meaning, what I mean, it will affect a different aspect of your current life. Current life. This is why if you don't know how to currentize a verse of the Quran, ask those who know. You can go sometimes to the shaykh and say, how does this verse apply in my life today? And believe me, you will probably be benefited from that. And once you get the gist of how to look into the verses and the stories of the past and so on, you will be able to benefit. You will be able to see the people of Noah, may peace be upon him, were destroyed because of X, Y, and Z. Today, I'm involved in X and Y. So what do I expect? I better erase it, eradicate it before similar punishment overtakes me. Now you're speaking. Now you're benefiting. And this is why the word of Allah is such. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, he heard the opening verses of Surah Taha. And immediately, the journey he made from that house of his sister up to the house of Al-Arqam ibn Abi Al-Arqam radiallahu anhu, that was walking in the light of the Qur'an, literally as well as spiritually. Subhanallah. He was walking in the light of the Qur'an. He was walking in the light of a few verses that he had heard. Like I said, People used to say, the Qur'an has too many rules. Islam came in order to take away your drinking, in order to cover up your women, in order to do this, do that. Well, you want happiness, you want contentment, here is the ingredient. Some people never ever looked at it that way. So this is why the likes of Abu Jahl, Al-Akhnas ibn Shuraiq, they heard the Qur'an being read. They used to go at night in order to hide and listen privately where, when nobody was watching. They thought nobody's looking at us. And they were listening to the tilawah and the recitation of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they understood what he was saying. They achieved sweetness, but they had no idea. They did not want to believe in the unseen. They had hatred, they had jealousy. They were listening to it in order to know how to tackle it. But they knew that it's a sweet word. And they came back the next day. And they came back the next day. If you know the story, if you don't, inshallah, you'll find it out. What they did. Why didn't they turn? Because their hearts were not sincere. With a sincere heart, my brothers and sisters, one verse of the Qur'an will change your life. One verse with a sincere heart will change your life. With an insincere heart, you can read what we call khatam after khatam, one after the other, complete, complete. Your life has not moved. If anything, you can even be walking backwards. 
Because if you're walking in the light of the Qur'an, that is the only time you will be able to see the goodness in your own life, in the lives of others. You will know what is expected of you. But if you are not prepared to turn on that torch, you will be in the darkness even if you hear the recitation of the Qur'an. And even if people tell you about the Qur'an, you won't be able to benefit. Sometimes you have a weakness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. If you don't work on that weakness, you'll end up having another weakness with it. This is why, my brothers and sisters, if there are 10 things wrong with me, and I'm conscious of these 10 things, and I really want to benefit from these, meaning I want to improve on these 10 things, and that is my aim. I am better than someone who doesn't have an intention to improve on those 10 matters. Because before you know it, 10 becomes 11, 11 becomes 12, 12 becomes 13. But when you're conscious about your 10, what's the minimum that will happen? The worst case scenario, it will stay 10. Do you understand what I'm saying? If not, it increases. It reminds me of a guy who was exposed. You know, his weaknesses were exposed. Now they say a talk is not a talk unless you have something on a lighter note. So let's go for it. The example of a guy who was on his bicycle riding at night and the policeman tells him, Stop, stop, you don't have lights. And he says, move away, move away. I don't have brakes either. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. From one, it became two. He was being penalized for one thing. And moments later, it became two. So he gave himself away. Had he concentrated on his lights, inshallah, or his brakes, it would have improved. The point I'm trying to make here is, sometimes we have one weakness. When we're working on it, it remains one. When you don't work on it, you expose yourself to the second one. Allahu Akbar. You see? So don't say that was just a tale without a moral. It had a moral to it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us breaks and lights. <laughs> and that's a beautiful example because in life, my brothers and sisters, you need light to see the path. And you need breaks to know where you stop. Very important. Sometimes we see the light. When we don't know where to stop, we start judging others. Oh, that person is bad. This person is going to Jahannam. Khalidam fiha wa ghadib Allahu alayhi wa la'anahu wa a'addalahu adaban azeema. Are you Allah? What's happening, man? Are you Allah? Relax, take it easy. They might be in Jannah before you and me. Who knows? So you need, you've seen the light? Thank Allah. And try and show people the same switch you saw to turn on your torch. And show them, you know what? My torch, I saw. I saw the path because of this. And I'd like you to see what I saw. Be an open-minded person who looks at others with love for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is when you are walking in the path of the Qur'an. Because I want to draw for you something very important. The person who walked upon the light of the Qur'an to the highest degree possible was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So for you and I to walk upon the true light of the Qur'an, we definitely need to study his lifestyle. And we need to study what he said. And we need to study the way he explained the verses of the Qur'an. And we need to look into how we should be. Even if I may not have arrived at a certain point, I've already given this example. If I may not have arrived at a point of height, subhanallah, at least I will be moving in that direction. But when I'm not interested in a very high level, you know sisters, sometimes you see that they may not have been dressed appropriately, even the brothers, some of them, you know, skinny jeans, half bummers and so on, you know what we talk about. <laughs> but sometimes you know that this person, they, when the movement comes towards the deen, sometimes their movement can be a very, very quick movement compared to your movement. And I always say, and this is a statement because I've seen things happening of late. People come and they start condemning, condemning. And then you go and say, who is this man condemning everyone? Search his life and you find he was literally a DJ in a nightclub. Five years ago. Or you find he was a bouncer at a nightclub. I've seen this real life example. Bouncer at a nightclub. MashaAllah, Allah gave him hidayah and guidance and he came out and he, he left his bad ways and he saw the light of the Quran. He began to walk in its path. One weakness. What's the weakness? He condemns and dooms people as though he is the one who owns heaven and hell. Come on, relax. Why does he do that? He saw the light when he turned 45 and he wants you to see the light in 45 seconds. Yes. 
In the same way, 45 years later, you moved so quickly up the ladder. Remember, others might move very, very fast above the ladder, higher than you in 50 years. You just need to plant the seed. Carry on. After you're gone, they might see the light. Amazing. If Allah wanted, He could have guided the people of Makkah in one split movement of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because guidance is in the hands of Allah. Why did it have to take so many years, so much persecution, so much sacrifice, so much in terms of revelation and re reasons of revelation and the driving to Medina Munawwara and the coming back and the victory of Makkah. And thereafter you have people entering Islam, Afwajan, in armies and so on after 23 years Mission accomplished. Why did it have to take so long? To show me and you. Many reasons. One of them is to show me and you that sometimes you need to give people time. Allah knows when is the right time for them to accept the deen. Take a look at Abu Sufyan. It was Fath Makkah. It was the victory of Makkah. When he accepted Islam, yet he was an enemy before that. Take a look at Khalid ibn al-Walid. It was after the Hijrah to Medina. And after some of these uh, battles that took place against the Muslims on his side, that he accepted the faith. And when he accepted the faith for us today, he is known as radiyallahu anh. We don't look at what he did in the past. We only learn a lesson from it. Look at that. So never underestimate the devil's plan. He can drop you after 40 years of, or even 70 years of obedience. And never underestimate the power and the mercy of Allah. He can guide you after 60, 70 years of disobedience. The only question I have do you have a guarantee that you're going to see the next moment or tomorrow? And that we are taught in the light of the Quran. <laughs> Indeed, when the fixed and prescribed time of Allah comes, it will not be delayed. Whatever Allah's prescription or prescribed time is, it's not going to be delayed. Whether it is your death or your anything else to do with your life, Allah knows if He has predestined something Specific moment, that moment X, Y, and Z shall occur according to the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how longer do you have to turn to Allah? The answer is, I don't even have the next few moments. I need to turn now. My brothers and sisters, I invite you and myself to make an intention with the beauty of your heart here and now that we will do whatever we can. We will do whatever we can to earn the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I really invite you with the goodness of your heart to promise the Almighty that you will do whatever you can to earn the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And inshallah grow with that. Have that intention every day. I need to become a better person. Ask yourself, where am I faltering? Look at the Quran. Like I said, if you search the Qur'an, it will remind you life is short. And if you search the Qur'an, it will remind you that Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. And if you search the Qur'an, you, it will remind you of the most hopeful verse of the whole Qur'an. The verse that has the most hope, subhanallah. When Allah says to us all, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ وَأَنِيبُوا إِلَىٰ رَبِّكُمْ وَأَسْلِمُوا لَهُ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَأْتِيَكُمُ الْعَذَابُ ثُمَّ لَا تُنْصَرُونَ Allahu Akbar. Allah says, say to my worshippers, O my worshippers, who have transgressed against themselves by engaging in sinful behavior, by oppressing themselves, those who have gone beyond the limits, tell them, never ever lose hope in the mercy of Allah. Allah forgives all sin. Subhanallah. Allah forgives all sin. Indeed, Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. What a beautiful verse. It gives me hope, it gives you hope. The very next verse, Allah says, turn to Allah before it is too late and the punishment overtakes you and then you're not helped. Look at how beautifully Allah words it. He tells you, I'm merciful, I'm ready, I love you, I'm waiting for you. There are, there are hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which explain how Allah becomes so happy when you turn and I turn. Imagine, subhanallah. 
Allah is waiting for me. Inna Allah Ta'ala yabsutu yadahu bil layli liyatuba musi'u al-nahar wa yabsutu yadahu bil nahari liyatuba musi'u al-layl hatta tatlu'a al-shamsu min maghribiha. What a powerful hadith. Every day Allah stretches his hand in order to forgive those who have committed sin by night. And every night he stretches his hand to forgive those who have committed sin during the day until the sun shall rise from the other side. How merciful. Allah is so merciful. But at the same time he says, hang on. You don't know how long you're going to live for. Beautiful. Subhanallah. What an explanation. What a light of the Quran. So your life, your happiness, your goodness, your contentment is within the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Getting back to the first verse that I read. Allah says, A reminder has come to you, O man, from your Rabb. وَشِفَاءٌ لِمَا فِي الصُّدُورِ And that which is cure. Cure for that which is in your heart. وَهُدًا And guidance. وَرَحْمَةً and mercy. For whom? For those who believe. So do you believe? Well, if you do, there is mercy in the Qur'an. My brothers and sisters, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us all, to grant us goodness, to help us to be able to walk upon the light, the light of the Qur'an. Remember, as I said in one talk, you will not be able to hear every aspect of the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you will at least be motivated to swim deeper, and to go and look into it. Never lose hope in the mercy of Allah. In the same way that I have hope that Allah will have mercy upon me, I need to be worried that if I continue in this sin of mine, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may expose me. He may make my life difficult. He may cause something to happen that might be so negative in my life because of the negativity that I planted. When you sow a seed of goodness, it will grow a tree of goodness. When you sow a seed of evil, you better pluck it out of there before the tree starts growing. Because once the tree has grown so big, it becomes difficult to chop it down. Someone emailed me today. And I get a lot of emails. I, I cannot really read more than about 10 or 12 at a time. But the truth is, someone said, you know, there is something I don't understand. I love someone so much, so deeply. Why can't I marry them? And it's mutual. And Allah's definitely put this love in me. And this person happens to be not a Muslim or a male who's not a Muslim. Why do they have to revert? And why does this have to happen? And why and why and why? And so many, and if Allah didn't want it, why did He put it in my heart? And I'm sitting and I'm thinking, Ya ilaha al-alameen, O oh Allah, have mercy on this child. And O oh Allah, have mercy on whoever this guy is, whoever he is. Have mercy on them. Ya Allah, guide them to your light. Ya Allah, show them the path. I may or may not be able to help them because sometimes people are not ready to listen to the truth. But I can give you the truth now in the form of a lecture. Let me tell you, love, initially you are in full control of it. Do you know that? It's a seed. You have it in your pocket. I know sisters might say, I don't have pockets. Okay, don't worry. You have it somewhere perhaps. It's a seed. It's up to you where you want to plant it. And once it's planted, you can pluck it out. For as long as you haven't watered it and it hasn't grown. When you water it every day, I love you, M-W-A-H, quick, quick, you know? <laughs> yeah? And you know you have these little emoticons that make it easy for you to lie. An emoticon makes it very easy for you to lie. And you know, I always say, those who say L, you know, an L, and 20 O's, and another L, they've never laughed. <laughs> they don't laugh. Someone told me, I didn't know, you know, once on, on, on Twitter I said LOL. And someone said, well that's haram. And someone else said, someone else said, you know what? I didn't know uh, muftis can actually LOL. <laughs> and I thought to myself, I don't want to get dragged into a discussion, but I have a lot of answers that people will actually find fascinating. Let me tell you, one of the answers is, most of those who say LOL, do not laugh out loud at that time. <laughs> Can I ask you a question? By show of hands. How many of you, every time you say LOL, have actually laughed out loud? Put up your hand high. <laughs> every time you've said LOL, you have laughed out loud. Put up your hand. I can count two or three hands. That's it. The rest of us are quite honest. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> <laughs> Now Allah bless you. Wallahi, jazakallah khair. Thank you for that. Some of us are quite, uh, you know, 
we, we, we write what we mean and the rest of us, subhanallah, including myself, if we've said it, it does not mean. Sometimes we're actually frowning and had they known what we look like. So the point, let's get back to what we're saying. My brothers and sisters, let's get back to something more serious. So that seed, my sisters, don't allow yourself to plant it in a place where you're going to regret later on. Where did my tree grow? In the middle of my driveway. Allahu Akbar. Now my dad is disagreeing. My mom is disagreeing because they can't reverse the car. Allahu Akbar. And you are complaining. What's happening? You know, no, nobody's supporting me. Why did Allah, if Allah didn't want this to happen, why did it? Well, you put the seed there. Don't blame Allah today. You watered it and you saw it growing and you knew where it was growing and you watered it until the bark became so big you hugged it every now and again. Allahu Akbar. And then what happened? Now you want to tell yourself, La ilaha illallah, Allah is the one who put it and if this was so bad, why is it in my heart? So Allah says, in the Qur'an we have shifa lima fi sudur. We have cure for that which is in your heart. The Qur'an tells you to be careful where you place that love. The love of Allah comes higher than the love you have of your hair, of your face, of anyone else. The love that you have of material items, your car, your house, your colors, your perfume, your scent, your accessories. Everything else, the love of Allah is far higher than all of that. That's what the Quran tells you. And you can't say, nah, you know what? I like my handbag. When I walk with it, everyone must look and my shoes must make a sound. You know, God, 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 God. <laughs> Allah, it doesn't help. It doesn't help. If that's the case, my sisters, well, you need to start walking in the light of the Quran and see the repercussion of that type of behavior. What are, it's not wrong to have your handbag or your shoes. But what is wrong is to give that preference over your maker. That's what's wrong. So you need to know where to draw the line. This is what we're saying. We are not one of those, or I'm not one of those who will tell you, divorce yourself from the world completely. Because I need to live, you need to live. And the Quran says, قُلْ مَنْ حَرَّمَ زِينَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي أَخْرَجَ لِعِبَادِهِ Say, who is it that is prohibiting the beauty that Allah has actually taken out for His worshippers? Allah has given us certain things we're allowed to benefit from. But believe me, make sure you know where you're planting your seed. Make sure you know that you are watering it. Every time you pass an SMS, you make a phone call, you are saying something you meet for, whether it is coffee or whatever else it is, every time you're actually growing the seed. If it is a seed of halal, you will benefit from the tree that is grown. And if it is a seed of haram, a day will come when you will have to chop that tree down, come what may. Believe me, sometimes Allah may help you to convert that particular tree into a tree of goodness. You know, it reminds me of the avocado tree. We've got quite a few in my yard. Mashallah, beautiful avocados. Luckily, I come from Zimbabwe. One thing that grows there properly, avocados. <laughs> you know why avocado starts with an A and we write at the bottom starting with Z. So alhamdulillah, it works. A to Z. The tree gave us avocados that were not tasting nice. So we asked someone, look, what happens here? He said, what you do, you take some steel nails and knock them into the tree. We did that and the following season we had the sweetest of fruit. That doesn't mean if your spouse is being a bit bitter, knock some steel nails into them. <laughs> but what it does mean, subhanallah, is that sometimes you have a tree that may have been wrong initially. But you can do some things to sweeten it, to correct it, to rectify it. But sometimes you won't be able to. You have to chop the tree down. Don't blame Allah for it. My sister, my brother, you did it with your own hands. You were the one responsible. You didn't think. You were hidden in emotion. Control yourself. You hand your heart to Allah and then whatever is the residue, you can give it to the others in the sense that you can allow your spouse to have a portion of it and so on. And a lot of the times people who tell you, you know what, I promise you I'm going to marry you, you don't ever end up marrying them. It's a reality. Hey, the guys are looking at me because they've already promised so many people. I don't know. Please, my brothers, don't look at me that way. I'm saying something honest. You have an answer to give to Allah. You promised someone something and built their hopes. Why did you suddenly let it come crashing? You are, you are answerable to that. How I, did you build somebody's hopes just to abuse them and use them? This is what's happening on the globe. And we know about it. And we're trying to help one another. That's why I tell you, my brothers and sisters, ask yourself, where did I plant my seed? This is the tenth time I'm saying it. And how did I grow it? Every time you tell someone, I love you, I adore you, you know, I miss you, and so on. Yeah, you water. It's water that's going onto the seed. And the tree is growing, it's growing. Ask yourself, is this a proper seed or not? If it is not, do one of two things. 
either rectify it with those steel nails or chop it down. Before you know it, it's going to harm you. And then don't blame Allah. Why do we say this? Where do we get it from? The beauty of the Quran. Allah tells you. He warns you of lowering the gaze. Where do you find it? In the Quran. People say, why do I have to do that? Well, it's in the Quran. They, he warns you, for example, of how to, to don clothing that it actually covers your beauty, for example. And it, the address is for men as well to lower their gazes and to dress appropriately. Many men have this misnotion that, you know what? Dress code is only for women. Allahu Akbar. A few days ago I tweeted about dress code and I think it must have been an Arab brother who perhaps did not know English so well. He says, well, dressing is for women. Why don't you talk about men? He said, a dress code has got nothing to do with men or women. It's got to do with clothing. It's the English language. But anyway, excuse them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala benefit us. So that is a mistake. When you think Islam talks of dress code, it means what type of dresses you should wear, you're wrong. It's talking to men as well. My brothers and sisters, my brothers, you need to make sure you dress appropriately. Dress in a beautiful way. In a way that really portrays the image of exactly who you are. Who are you? Who are you supposed to be as a Muslim? Try your best. I have found something very, very powerful and I'm going to share it with you. When you appear as a Muslim and associate with Muslims, it automatically is a major deterrent between you and sin. Did you know that? It's an automatic major deterrent between you and sin. Think about it. So when you do not want to appear as a Muslim and you do not want to associate with the rest of the Muslimin, you might feel a bit free and so on, but it's very easy for you to water the wrong tree, the wrong plantation. It's easy for you. Why? Because perhaps you're not really who, you're not being who you're supposed to be. I know people might argue that, you know, it's so hard to be with Muslims. They're so judgmental. They look down upon you. Well, that's why we're there to remind one another, my brother, my sister, don't judge. I know people sometimes, and I'm passionate about this, because I know people sometimes who have had terrible habits. But because we have accepted them, we've spoken to them politely, and we've tried to show them the good character and conduct and help them through, they have come out to be the strongest of Muslimin. And they've been so appreciative of how we've supported them. So my sisters, we support you. My brothers, we really love you. All of those who are here this evening. The reason why I am here, solely for the love of Allah. And the love of everyone for the sake of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for me, what brings me to you, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's religion, and the deen, and the contact, and the connection that we have, in deen and in humanity. I am a person who does not like to pick on little differences to show how far apart we are, but on the millions of commonalities that show how just close we are and how human we are and how each one of us needs the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We will be able to develop in the mercy of Allah. But that path and the journey, the speed of it differs from person to person. What I encourage you today as I end my talk, brothers and sisters, turn the torch on, walk in the light of the Qur'an. Try and understand that Qur'an will drive you to the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Make an intention. I'm going to try my best to improve on aspects and I will be from those who will be motivated by the most powerful speech there ever is. There ever is. Subhanallah. I invite you at the end of this talk, to listen to the words of Allah, not only in the Arabic language, but even in a language you know. Of late, you might have heard perhaps on the net, I have said that I have been given a gift from a friend of mine in Malaysia of a disc which had on it solely the English translation of the Quran. And this person reverted to Islam many years back and he gave it to me. And when I heard it, initially I thought to myself, the Arabic is the word of Allah, that has the power. Yes, indeed. But the non-Muslim who was sitting with me heard the English of it and he says, Wow, this must be the book of Allah. The book you guys follow, the Quran. I said, it is. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. The Quran is totally different from the Bible and other books. The Quran is Allah speaking. It is Allah addressing. Try it out. See, understand it. Make an effort towards it. Your doors will definitely open. You need to have sincerity. 
believe in Allah and you see your doors opening until we meet again I say sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad subhanallah wa bihamdih subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk